All right, let us say hello to a big winner from this past Saturday night in Las Vegas. Stepped in on short notice to face Donald Cowboy Cerrone in the co-main event of UFC Vegas 26. And he picks up a huge win. First round TKO with a big flurry. Huge win for Alex Morono, who is kind enough to join us less than 48 hours later. Alex, how are you? Good, man. It's good to be back on the show. Absolutely. Congratulations on a huge win. This was some performance, especially on short notice. Opportunity knocked. You answered in a big way. How does it all feel less than 48 hours later? Man, it's, it's still kind of surreal. Uh, really best case scenario. I was talking to my uh, my striking coach, a guy named Matt Wall. He's been in my corner for every one of my fights since I was like 17. And uh, and we were just talking. I was kind of like a perfect storm of everything kind of working out the right way. And uh and it was just good, you know, getting the fight was, was awesome, but then winning the fight was, the, you know, the big goal, you know, it's kind of like a similar scenario, fighting Anthony Pettis, and, uh, and this time I had to make sure to make it work. And I did, it was cool, and there was a lot of really positive takeaways from that. This came together, obviously, very quickly after Diego Sanchez was released from the company last week, and I know Cowboy kind of had a list of names to, to sort of veer through, and not sure how it landed on you getting the shot. So I'm curious how this all happened. Like, when did you find out this was a thing, and that you had the chance to fight Donald Donald Cerrone in a co-main event? Yeah, honestly, I'd be curious to understand like the logistics behind as well. Like, you know, I'm curious what if there were other names out there and and and, and who those guys were, and uh, and yeah, so it was cool. So uh, Wednesday on I won't forget Wednesday, right around noon. Is when uh, is when I think the news broke that Diego was released, and one of my best friends from back from high school, he's the one who actually got me into MMA way back in the day, had sent me a text, and just as soon as I saw my phone, I saw and I called my coach before I could even respond, and I was like, Coach, you know, Sanchez is out. Uh, let the guys know, let the UFC know that I, I would take this fight, and my coach was like, Morono, are, are are you sure? Like, are you in good enough shape? And, uh, and, you know, Cerrone's going to be fired up and ready for this fight because he was going to fight Diego. And, like, especially a fight he knows he can win, he, uh, he would train hard for him. Like, you know, there was a couple of videos of him training. And I was like, Coach, trust me, I can do this. And, and then Safe, Coach Safe was like, all right, Moreno, I'm gonna, I'll trust you. I'll let him know. And it was cool. Just like, so then I'm already, I already have a little pressure going into this because if I did get the fight and, and lose, uh, Coach would never have let me, you know, hear the end of it. So, uh, so we let him know Wednesday. Uh, and we get like a thumbs up, like, okay, cool. We, we got the information. And so I kind of assume I'm fighting just in case. So I'm already, I'm already training super hard. So I didn't like train much harder, but I started doing things stylistically a little bit different. Um, you know, so usually when I'm not in camp, if I'm training with guys, I'll try to like emulate their opponents as much as possible. I stopped doing that and I started working on what I'm good at, you know, so I train, you know, a little bit on the week, you know, normal, but I don't really hear anything back. And Saturday is one of our hardest training days at my gym. We grapple for an hour and a half really hard, nothing but live rounds, and then we do MMA sparring. But that Saturday, we had a really big local tournament, the grappling games, and I had over 80 people from my gym signed up, which is outrageous. The most I've ever had before was like 40, and we doubled that. It was about 50 kids and 30 adults. And, man, we, we crushed at the tournament. So all day Saturday, probably from like 9 a.m. to about 6 p.m., I'm, I'm coaching – and I still don't hear anything. So I'm like, all right, the fight's probably not going to go down. So, you know, I come home, eat finally, and, uh, and uh, so I'm playing Warzone, and it's about 1230, and I get a call from Coach Safe, which is super unorthodox. It's really late. And I'm like, as soon as I see my phone light up and I see it's Coach, you know, calling, I'm like, oh, shit, this fight's going down. So I answer, and Coach is like, hey, you know, I hope, I hope you didn't do anything weird because it's looking good. We still got it. We didn't get a hard yes, but I think it took a few days for Cerrone to deliberate about what he was going to do. I don't know if he chose of the list or, or the UFC chose, or he was just like telling him he was down to fight. And then Sunday is when I get like the official, the fight is on. So, you know, I try to train pretty good Sunday. I had to call a few guys just to get some rounds in. And then I, then I train really hard Sunday or Monday. I do like several three, five minute round sessions, like three, five strength conditioning, three, five, super hard, no gi, three, five in the May. I take a break. I come back in the evening and I do a bunch of kickboxing rounds. I honestly felt great. Like all my, all my fresh, you know, uh, teammates were kind of getting tired because I was just really trying to put a pace on them. And, uh, and, and man, it was just, it was cool. It was all so sudden. I almost prefer you know, like a two or three week notice camp if I'm already in shape because there's there's less stress. There's way less wear and tear on the body. 
Um, and then especially, you know, the fight ended right at the end of the first round. And, like, I'm never tired at the end of the first round, but I'm starting to feel the fight fatigue. And I felt maybe better at the end of that fight than, than other fights where I had full fight camps. So, I mean, I'm probably going to end up doing this more often. Maybe not taking such short-notice fights, but not, like, hitting the really, really hard aspects of fight camp until maybe, like, three weeks out. Because I'm always training, so it's not like I'm ever out of shape. Yeah, because this is the second time in a row you essentially had short notice fights. You basically just went in there and, and fought. I know Pettis was a little bit longer in terms of like the notice, but and then it ended up being the final fight of Pettis's run in the UFC. I mean, that, that that fight didn't go your way, but you know, for them to come back your way and and go with you for this opportunity against another legend of the sport, the obvious the UFC obviously sees something in you. So that had to make you feel pretty good despite coming off the, off of the loss, did it not? Yeah, I've always been super grateful. The UFC has given me a, a lot of opportunities. Uh, granted, I got a decent winning record. I'm eight and four with one no contest, which isn't bad. Uh, but even like when I was on the undercard, I would often be like the featured prelim. I was the pre featured prelim for like maybe four or five fights, and they, they always gave me opportunities. Now, now to be fair, uh, my debut was taken on short notice when I fought Josh Berkman. Uh, that fight was put together pretty short notice, and what people don't know. Is my first contract, I went two wins and two losses. Well, one of those losses got overturned to a no contest, but it doesn't matter. And I did not immediately get re-signed. And, like, that, I was sort of in limbo. So they actually offered me uh, Bobby Nash in China on, like, two weeks' notice, and I took it. But uh, the visa didn't work out. And then they offered me Diego Lima in, I think, North Carolina in January of 2016, maybe 2017. I forget. But I took it as well, and then Lima's the one who turned down the matchup because he didn't want a short notice opponent change. So, like the fact that I had taken two pretty, you know, risky fights on short notice, then there Sean Shelby was like, "Hey, thanks for helping out. We'll get you that fight in Austin." So that's when that Berkman fight came to be. And uh, and then you know I had two fights in Houston in my hometown with super favorable matchups, one against Sheldon Westcott, who I would have freaking blazed through. And uh, I don't know what happened. He just, he just doesn't really fight anymore. He was one of the least active fighters on the roster. But then I got a random young Nico Price, which was hard to deal with. And then, uh, and then I fought again in Houston against Diego Lima, and he pulled out. He had to get neck surgery. That was legit. And then I got a very unknown chaos. So I've never turned anything down. I've always really tried to show them that I'm like down to, to work with them and, and, and fight for them. And I think they know that and appreciate that. Plus, I know they like my style of fighting. I usually won't go in for takedowns or try to clinch or, or do much. I usually stand there and trade. So I know they like that. I know the fans like that. Most importantly, I enjoy doing that. So it all works out. What did you make of this whole Diego Sanchez release? Like everything going on with him, the, the, the coach being such a prevalent part of his story, Joshua Fabia, the bizarre training videos that were leaked. Like what have you made of this whole situation? Like obviously it led to a good thing for you, but you know, just outside looking in, what have you thought of all of this? It's weird. You know, I got a, a cool black belt coach in my gym, a guy named Joel, real serious, really good student. And uh, he actually bought a school of self-awareness T-shirt just kind of as a joke. But I always wanted to fight Diego because he was like one of my favorite fighters. And he would like run to the middle of the octagon and just start throwing down. And I always wanted to fight him for that. But then when he got this weird coach, I, I kind of wanted to fight him to, to let his coach know that he's that's just wrong what they're doing. It makes me feel bad for Diego. Like, genuinely, I, I still like Diego, especially watching his interviews. He's, he seems like a sweet guy, and he just seems like he's being led astray. And it's one of those things where everyone around him is like, hey, this guy's bad news. You need to get away from him. And, and you can just, you know, that guy's in his ear telling him they're all wrong. I'm here to protect you. But, dude, this stuff is weird. It's the weirdest coaching I think anyone has ever seen kind of at this level that's gotten this kind of spotlight. I'm sure you watched the videos of him kind of going off on Paul Felder. And Megan Olivi, it was funny watching Paul Felder bite his tongue for a few minutes and then <laughs> tell him to go F off. But uh, <laughs> even when Stefan Bonner was filming it, you can tell Stefan Bonner's like, oh, this is weird. But it's just it's just weird. I mean, weird's a good word for it. And uh, and sad is another good descriptive word for it, man. It's it's strange. And and and, and you know, it, it really, if we really break it down, like I can thank Fabia's weirdness for getting me this fight and opportunity and and, you know, this has been by far the biggest thing I've ever done in the UFC. It's just crazy how you know, the butterfly effect works. And it's just, it's still wild and I'm still kind of absorbing it all. 
how was the weight cut on this for such a short notice fight? Like you ended up making it, but was it, was it miserable or because you, you're always training and you're always in really good shape. It wasn't as bad as it could have been. No, that was one of the biggest factors I, uh, I've been doing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I say, I don't know why I've been doing a lot of rounds of training and like when I, I spar quite a bit, but I, I never really spar that hard. And like when I spar, my primary goal is to be defensive in terms of not absorbing shots to my head. I can tell you, I've been doing this for like 14 years. I, I can count on two hands the amount of times I've had like a headache after sparring. Very, very rare. I really try to be defensively sound. And uh, and just so I'll give you a rundown. So on Tuesday, I, I drove to Fortis just to train, which was great. I did an hour of gi jiu-jitsu. I did an hour of no gi then we did an hour of five minute rounds. I mean, I must have, I don't know how many rounds I did. And then after the hour, I had stayed after and I had given some guys like their hard rounds. So I had done several rounds of sparring. Then on Thursday, I went to a war and trained with Trevor Giles and did like 10 rounds of MMA sparring, just for fun, five bigs and five littles. And then I met up with one of our guys who I do boxing with. And I did five threes of boxing. And then that evening, I did five fives in MMA prepping one of my guys for a title fight. So when like when one day alone, I had done almost 20 rounds of sparring. So the weight was good. So that Saturday night, as soon as I got the call from coach, I went and weighed myself and I was 188 pounds, which is a pretty average for like not in fight camp. When I'm in camp, I try to be right about 185 and I try to stay there so I can keep durability. And uh, Sunday I did a 24 hour fast. Monday I trained really hard and ate super clean. And then I left for Vegas right around 184 which is a pretty average weight cut. The morning of the, the fight, or the morning of weigh-ins, I should say, I just sweat about five pounds out, which, which wasn't bad. I, I, can, I can sweat that off really easy. It felt good. It was, a, it, was like a, it was like a one pound above average weight cut, and I made it easy. I almost kind of prefer it because I rehydrated really well. And uh, if you guys don't know, the UFC PI is there, and they actually like supply meals for us and give us like a rehydration process. And I followed everything to a T and felt better than ever. That's good to hear. Um, you know, heading into the fight and with Cowboy, he, and he touched on this at the media day, he's touched on it in, in many interviews leading into the fight. He's not a fast starter. That first round is, is always pretty tough on him because he needs those first five minutes or so to get going. And I'm sure you were very well aware of that, especially since this is a fight that came together very quickly. Was it important for you to really get after him in that first round, put the pressure on him, try to get him out of there quick. You know, it, it, yes, but but not focused in that way specifically. I couldn't just like get there and start to flurry because I didn't want to gas. Like the last thing I wanted to do was gas. And I know he had just trained really hard for that. I think it was submission underground, but his match against Rafael Dos Anjos. So like I know his wrestling and grappling pacing was really strong. And, like what I what I could not have allowed was to get taken down and held down. So I didn't want to risk, you know, stepping in too much. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to keep breaking his rhythm. I know Muay Thai guys need to find rhythm. And like, if you watch his fight against Ali Aquinta, one of my favorite cowboy moments, because he was an underdog in that fight. And uh, he just took it to him five fives with such beautiful striking. But I tried to really break his rhythm. So a lot of side to side movements, and uh, I tried to really hit a lot of fakes and feints and, and, and not be predictable when I was going to enter and then turn really fast. And most importantly, when he came in, I had to, like, keep a tight guard and come in myself. So breaking his rhythm in the beginning was uh, what I believed was most important. And I think I did that to perfection. That was maybe my best performance in the octagon. And I'll tell you, I felt so comfortable. I kept visualizing the walkout. I knew I was going to be walking out first. And it's just such a consistent feeling being inside the octagon. Like the canvas is very rough and the mats are very soft. They almost feel like gel and the lights are very hot. There's no other feeling like being in the octagon than being in the octagon. So I tried to really put myself in that position and, and visualize seeing him across mean mugging me, which he was, which was cool. Hearing the cowboy song was also cool. But uh, I just felt so very comfortable. And like in, in the fights and training, it's not the same because it's not so violent or volatile. But like in the fights, it feels like the striking exchanges is a bunch of collisions. And I feel like I've gotten really good at timing those collisions and then moving my head off so I'm not getting collided on in the face. 
you know, trying to keep it elsewhere. And uh, so, man, it just worked out so well. I felt so comfortable. I love being in the octagon. I, I got two, I got two plus hours in there already. So I, I hope to like double that time eventually. Yeah, you 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 landed that sort of like duck under counter right hand over the top. It was beautiful. I mean, it was like a it was just a beautiful shot. You had him badly hurt. You came in hard, but then it seemed kind of going by what you were saying before. It seemed like you backed off a tad. Like you became patient in the approach. Like rather than just flurry in and just release everything you looked for openings that's where you landed that big body shot and then you went on to finish the fight like it was a blitz for sure but there were so i'm curious like was there some inner dialogue with yourself when you said like you know this dude's hurt but he's super durable don't blow out all your energy in this flurry let's be smart about this yeah yeah i, I was telling myself i was like pick your shots because i had, i had hurt him initially and then i had just like i'd flurried hard and a lot of the shots were starting to win so then, like, I took a step back, and that's when I threw that really hard shot to the body. I've been practicing that a lot, especially, like, because I know I spam right hands to the head a bunch in fights, and I'll get guys to block high. And uh, so I timed that one well and hit a hard body shot, which got him to kind of curl in. And I've been working a lot of really tight rear uppercuts. I feel like guys in MMA throw really wide rear uppercuts, so I've been really practicing, like, throwing it from my, like, brow and, like, moving my whole body with the shot and releasing it a lot later. And, uh, and then, yeah, and I just, I, I didn't want to waste a bunch of shots and let him recover by like hitting over the top of his guard. So I just tried to be accurate. And, uh, and, and yeah, after the first floor, I was like, all right, pick your shots, but stay on them without, without covering too much distance. And, uh, and I feel like I did that really well. Are you like Mark Goddard? Come on, let's go pull me off. Let's, let's end this thing. I'm glad Goddard stopped it when he did, uh, cause he was covering and like, I think had, those uppercuts that got the finish, they weren't really getting through flush. But I know his 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 defense got really narrow, and uh, and I had actually been working spinning elbows after watching Yuri hit him. So I think that's what would have come very shortly after. And uh, and it's cool because you know like the, the TKO was as legit as they get, but there wasn't that much damage. Like, I don't think his nose is broken, it was bleeding but not broken, and the shots were kind of hitting him in like the ear and temple and chin. Nothing too crazy. And uh, and I wasn't really thinking about this before the fight, but especially after, I'm just glad there was no damage. And, and you know, I'm pretty sure he'll be healed up in a week or two and be able to get back to it, back to doing what he do likes. And uh, not that I didn't want to hurt him. That's not, I'm trying, you know, if you're fighting someone, you better try to hurt him. That's the goal. But I'm just glad neither of us got, like, truly damaged. That, that was, that's, that's always good to see, especially after, you know, Dominic Reyes, what a fight. I got to say, man, I, I've always enjoyed watching him fight. That year is fun to watch. Like a broken orbital, man, that's just tough. You know, like, it sucks. If you, if you, like, get damaged with a victory, it's worth it. But if you get something broken with a loss, it, like, compounds the, the like, the the, the, the the toughness factor, like, the difficulty factor. And again, I'm just, I'm glad Cal was okay after that fight. And as if the night couldn't have gone any better for you, you got yourself an extra 50 G's. This, this is your first bonus. Like you've, you've gotten a fight of the night before, but this is your first performance bonus, wasn't it? It is. And my fight of the night got heavily taxed in China. So like in that fight, I made right at a hundred grand. I got like 25 to show, 25 to win, and then fight of the night. And they took about 40% off the top. It was, that was a hard stomach. So, I mean, I got the bonus, but, like, the bonus effectively mitigated the taxes that would have gone to the fight and show win. So, this was, like, my first true untouched bonus. Now, granted, I know I got to pay taxes here, which is cool, but, uh, but I mean, I, I, I made a big chunk of change. That was a six-figure overhand right. So, like, I'm getting paid. I'm going to definitely pay my coaches out. That was cool. There you go. And there's a... Uh... There's a lot of talk about Cerrone's career veering towards the end of the line. And I know Dana White has said in the past that he may need to have, quote unquote, that conversation with Donald about stepping away. While I feel like that day is coming, I also feel like he's not in the same boat as a lot of these guys. Like Donald just likes fighting. Like it's a thrill seeking thing for him. Like he doesn't have to fight. He just likes fighting. So I feel like the UFC will probably give him another chance. Do you think he fights again? Man, I hope. I hope he fights again. Uh, I'll tell you, I can't imagine him at 155. I know he's a bit leaner, but he was a fair-sized welterweight. I remember looking across the cage from him, and I was like, huh, doesn't look like a 55-er. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he's definitely game. Like, you can, 
you can see it. I could see it in his eyes when when we were exchanging. Like when I would land a punch, he like would double down and kind of grimace back. And uh, and, and yeah, I hope he drops down to fifty five. I'm sure he will. And I, it would be cool. Like I know Miller and Guida drop down to forty five. If I'm not mistaken. Um, but like Lozon, I hope they give him a veteran. You know, you know, I just hope they give him another vet. And uh, it'd be cool to see him do at least one more. And so long as he's not getting like put to sleep, like even his McGregor knockout, even his Gaethje knockout, he wasn't like unconscious. He got hit and stunned and kind of like fell or blocked, even kind of like he did against me. But those, I know those don't take a huge toll. And like his fight with Nico was competitive. His fight with Pettis was competitive. I mean, I always enjoy watching Cowboy fight. If that wasn't me fighting him, I would have definitely been tuning into that card. Granted, I had two teammates fighting, so I'd have watched it no matter what. But I would have certainly stayed and watched that Cowboy fight. Like he, uh, He's the man. I, I, I'm excited to see what he does next. Yeah, I actually – we do a matchmaking show on the uh, for the site, and I said if Don's going to do one more, let's run it back with Miller because he's got the win He's got the win over Jim, and that fight was seven years ago. And if he's going to go to 55, Jim it doesn't strike me – Jim's not a guy that's going to knock him unconscious. It's just going to be a fun fight between those two guys. The scrambles would be fun. I just feel like it would be a good – you know, a good story and a good like last fight to fight a guy like Jim one more time, just because he's got that confidence already. Yeah. Also, Joe Lozon would be cool. Plus, Miller and uh, Cerrone have a tie for the most appearances in the UFC. I think it's like 38 or 39, which is cool. <laughs> I don't know if I'll make it to 38 or 39, but like making it to 10 was my initial goal, which I beat. Um, um, I, that was number 13 or 14. So getting to 20 is a new goal. And then if I make it to 20, making it to 30 would be a new goal. But, you know, I actually had a question for you. When you heard that Sanchez pulled out, did you think Cerrone was going to get a replacement fight? Yes. And who did you think it would be against? I know, I mean, it was super open water, but did you have an idea? Uh, I didn't really know. Like, I knew, I knew there was, he had like a list of six guys. So I, I think they landed on somebody. I'm not sure exactly who. But for some reason, it didn't work out. And then it was just, it kind of got to the point where, you know, where are we going to go? Like, is it going to work out? And then it was just kind of getting Cowboy into the to the mindset, like you were talking about. Like, he was fighting Diego. There was some heat there. It was kind of a personal fight for him. And then it was just a matter of, like, taking that energy and putting it in the right place against the right opponent. So I, I had a feeling we would see him on the card. But it was weird because... Like a week prior, watching that other card, there was no mention of this card whatsoever. We didn't know what the main event was. We didn't know what was going on at all. So I'm like, damn, like, is 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 Cowboy going to fight? Do we have a main event? Is this card even going to happen? And then it all started coming together like a couple of days later. When when they announced that I was fighting them, what were your initial thoughts? Good damn fight. <laughs> oh, cool. Hey, okay, that's good, man. I know a lot of the MMA fans kind of knew it would be a banger. But uh, cool, man. That's good. I'll tell you that main event in uh, in Dillashaw versus Sanhagen. I was really looking forward to that fight. Really looking forward to that fight. I'm a big fan of Sanhagen. He's done so good for himself in the UFC. I had uh, I had gone to Elevation back in like 2016 just because I was like looking for uh, just like high level guys to work with every once in a while before I found Fortis. And I trained with Sanhagen, and and he was great in the training room. Uh, but man, when he shows up to fight, he he fights, man. He's a, like the spinning wheel kick against Marlon Moraes, like blew my mind. And then when he hit that flying knee on Frankie Edgar, just every fight before that, like even when he fought a Sun Sal, when he fought Lineker, I was like, man, these are tough fights. I hope he does well. And he would beat him and he would beat him and he would beat him. And he's put himself right into that title picture. And uh, that was a really cool main event. And then, like, Jeff Neal and Neil Magny were on the card, and Gregor Gillespie and, and Carlos Diego Fiera. It was such a crazy fight card that when the main event dropped out, and then when Sanchez and Sony dropped out, I was like, oh, man, this, this awesome card is starting to diminish. I just never knew I would be able to save it with being co-main against Cowboy. That was cool. Yeah. It really was a perfect storm for, for me. Absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned Diego Fajeda. He, he had that crazy fight with, I mean, that fight was insane with Gregor Gillespie. He ended up losing it. Uh, Jeff Neal dropped that decision to Neil Magny. I know they're your teammates and you probably did watch, but d d do you watch it with like full intent knowing that you're about to fight in a co-main event or do you need to somehow like separate yourself from it in case, you know, they lose or it, maybe it affects your mentality? Like how did you sort of approach that? No, I, I fought a lot of, uh, alongside teammates a lot of times, a lot of times. And if anything, when I have teammates lose, 
I'm like, all right, I have to, I have to wave our flag. Like I'm the, I'm the only soldier left with our team's flag. I have to run up the hill. I don't want to say it motivates me by any means. Cause like seeing your teammates win is more motivating, but it's okay. Like when I was an amateur one time, I had, I had myself and three other teammates fight on a, 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 a old school legacy card. It used to be called Lone Star Beatdown. And uh, I wasn't like getting our guys fight. So it was our coach and he was kind of a, uh, he was a little lax with, with, with who we would let fight. And the first two guys who fought got TKO'd in the first round. And I was like, oh, those guys. And they didn't train that much. And then one other teammate fought and won. And he also didn't train much. But I trained my ass off. I was actually fighting for an amateur championship. And, like, I went into the fight knowing I'd prepared and, and knowing I was going to do great. And, uh, and with CDF, I know he had a tough weight cut. And his fight with Gregor was great. He, I love watching CDF fight, man. He is a scrambling beast. Talk about a guy like he does great in the training room, but he shows up and fights well. And like with this fight against Gregor, they like both left it all in there. I, you know, you can't be mad at that performance. And I also, when I saw the Jeff Neal versus Neil Magny matchup, I, I knew that was a good fight for Jeff. Um, I know he, 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 there were, he had some internal problems, like not mentally, but I think physically going into it. I'm not too sure I need to talk to him. And I, and I did rewatch that fight. So I was warming up while that fight was going down. So I was watching clips of it. And every time I looked over, I saw Jeff throwing a quick one, two, and then pressuring in. And he put Magny's back on the cage. And I thought he had the first two rounds pretty locked. And the third, like, could have gone either way. I wasn't watching it super intently. But when they were reading the judges' scorecards and I heard him say 30-27, I was like, okay, cool. Jeff's got it easy. And then when they announced Neil Magny, I was really surprised. But I also didn't watch the fight for every minute because I was warming up. So I maybe saw a quarter of it. And that one was just odd. Neil Magny's got a, like a neutralizing style. It's, it's a strange style. It works for him. He's got a lot of wins. But, uh, I mean, how did you score that fight? 29-28 for Magny. Did you really? What, so what did you give him, the second and third? I gave Magny two and three, yeah. Okay. Okay. I, again, I, I can't sit here and, and, and argue and be baffled, but I didn't really <laughs> watch it super thoroughly. But I also am so biased. I, I think so highly of Jeff, and he's the man. I know he's going to get his stuff sorted out. And I'll tell you, I've trained with a lot of people, a lot of professionals in my day. Before I found Fortis, I would like go around town finding the best pros to give me the best work. And, and Jeff is something special. He's, he's good, man. I can't wait to see him back, especially with the vengeance. Nothing yeah, good things to say about my boy. Yeah, he um, he released a statement not long after the fight and said that he's going to take some time off. And and I mean, the guy almost died like less than a year ago. I mean, yeah. he's gone through so much. So like him taking some time. I think obviously that's the best thing for him at this point. He mentioned se- like he was dealing with some sepsis issues as well. Yeah. Like the guy has gone through a lot over the last year. And he's obviously one of the the, the bright prospects at 170 pounds. So. You know, to see him lose two straight, even though losing to Wonder Boy and Magny is, you know, it's no nothing to be ashamed of. It's still, you know, to see his momentum kind of halted like that, it's kind of rough. So hopefully he takes that time. Like you said, he deals with some of those internal issues with his health. And, you know, he comes back 100 percent no matter how long it takes. And because he's legit, man, he's he's the real deal. As legit as they get. Yeah, just the man. So we mentioned the matchmaking show and listeners like to throw out their suggestions on matchups. And you obviously were a very popular guy to matchmake for. And I think the two most popular picks were Randy Brown, who just got that quick win over the other cowboy. And the other, because you're, you're on this like quasi legends tour right now was Carlos Condit. So does anybody stick out to you at this point? Hell yeah. Or Robbie Lawler. Um, Or Robbie Lawler. That's good. I I loved, I've, I've thought I would have, fought Randy Brown already by now. He and I kind of got on the roster at the same time. We've had similar success, and he's fun to watch. I would certainly take that fight. I, man, a fight against Condit would be awesome. And he's coming off two wins, which is nice, because he had a bit of a tough tough skid there. Uh, and then or Robbie. I know my coach tried to get me the Robbie Lawler fight on the pay-per-view Houston card, but I believe the card was already filled up before they even announced the location. So that, that was quickly... Uh, kind of uh, thrown to the wayside. But yeah, any, either of those two fights would be awesome. Um, either one of them would be awesome. The guys are coming off wins. Carlos Comet especially would be cool to fight. Just I like I like fighting the vets just because, I mean, I, I only started training because I was a fan. So to be able to fight these guys 
is just cool, man. It's just so cool. And like when I fought Pettis, I was I I wasn't like all like, oh, this guy's a legend, this and that. I was like, man, I gotta fight this ex champion. Is he really are like are these guys really that good? Are they that high above everyone else? And again, I think I answered this well, because I'm not gonna say no, because that would be kind of a mean well uh, just uh, shitty things to say. But it's not that they're not that good. It's that I'm I'm at that level in the game as well, and I can compete with them. And uh, and man, I'll tell you that Pettis experience was very valuable going into the Cerrone fight because I had no I had no doubts or there were no unknowns. I was certain that I could I could stand there and trade with the best of them, and I proved that to very much so be the case. Two last quick things: uh, Are you going to be attending the pay per view on Saturday? Um, no. So actually my wife was, she loves going to these fights. We were going to get tickets, but they sold out super quick. Uh, so I'll be watching it at home for sure. But actually, uh, there's some fights the day after Fury Fighting Championships having a card on Fight Pass. So it's cool. I actually got to talk about it in the UFC because it's, you know, because the UFC airs it and I'll be doing the commentary for that. This will be the third time in a row. I've been doing commentary for them for a while. And we, in the first show, myself and two other guys who have both fought before, one of them's an ESPN host, radio host in Houston. The other one's a, a really decorated local pro fought Shinya Oki, fought in WBC guy named Todd Moore. And like Todd Moore was one of my first coaches, one of the first pros I trained with thoroughly. AJ Hoffman, the ESPN guy, is also the other, the other commentator. And I cornered him in like three or four fights. So we all know each other very, very well. And we did such a good job. We had such a good dynamic on the first show that the, the fight passed. Like production guys were like, hey, they did great. So Eric Garcia, the promoter for Fury, hired us on full time. And Dana White's going to be there. And actually, one of my guys is fighting. He's one of the three title fights. He's nine and three as a pro, Cameron Graves. His last his last fight, he defended his belt with a head kick knockout. The fight before that, he won the belt with a straight left knockout. He's a super prospect with a victory. He'll be signed to the UFC. So like prepping him for that is is my main goal this weekend. Who wins the title fight on Saturday, Oliveira or Chandler? Man, I really want to see Oliveira win. Really want to see it. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Not a fan of Chandler. I just didn't follow him that much in Bellator. He he crushed it in the UFC in his debut. I didn't realize how much of a jock he was. Like how crazy of an athlete he is. Like Dan Hooker is obviously the the better striker. I mean, like credentialed. Like he's a striker by trade. Whereas Chandler's a wrestler. And for a, a wrestler with great striking and crazy power, like I believe it was his athleticism that allowed him to bridge that gap and the striking difference. And I, I'm a big fan of Dan Hooker as well. I really like his handiwork. His fight with Dustin Poirier is one of my favorite fights in the UFC. And for him to put Hooker away like that, uh, it goes to show how, how dangerous he can be. And then to see Charles Oliveira, again, you know, he trained out of Houston with Makako for a while. So I always kept an eye on him. And to get so many submission finishes is crazy. But he was always so in and out. Like Cerrone finished him. He just had fights where he would, like, not lose easy, but he would just get finished. But then he's gone on this rampage of just finishing guys. Like, his fight with Kevin Lee is one of my favorite fights in UFC as well. Just because his off his striking is all offense and his submission is, like, super offensive. The submission game He's really fun to watch. But uh, he's got a really explosive fighter in Chandler. I think that's a tough fight. And it's a weird fight for the belt, too. And, like, obviously it's not the guy's fault. You know, they were given the title opportunity. And even Chandler said he thought the call was weird. But I think Gaethje Poirier is, like, what the fans wanted. I can understand why Poirier is fighting McGregor. I mean, who wouldn't fight McGregor? I just don't know why Gaethje wasn't thrown into that mix. Like, I think Gaethje versus Oliveira makes a little more sense. Or even Gaethje versus Chandler which would have been a banger of a fight. But uh, I'm not too sure. I mean, I know there's a lot of good matchups at lightweight. Tony Ferguson is all, an all-time favorite to watch. And, you know, he had that, I, if I figured, title eliminator fight against Gaethje, which was a fantastic fight. So that's just a good part all around. There you go. The dog is all fired up, man. But uh... <laughs> I'll just shut my door real quick. You know what? I, we're let, we're gonna, gonna we're gonna make sure that's not USADA. I'll be back in one second. We're, yeah. we're, we're gonna wrap anyway, so you're oh, good, man. You're let's, good. Let's, so let's finish up and make it. All right. Well, congr listen. Congratulations on the huge win, man. Incredible performance, and uh, just enjoy the win. And hopefully that's not USADA already, because that would be a uh, my man. Thank awesome. you so much. You guys take care. Thanks, man. <laughs> See you.